Welcome to the last session uh, of South Korean Film Industry Conference. And thank you all for staying with us despite the temptation to spend time with your family, uh, your partners and friends uh, on Friday evening uh, or Saturday morning in Asia. But first of all, I'd like to extend my gratitude to our wonderful staffs uh, at uh, Nam Center for Korean Studies, Kelsey, Evan, and Kate, uh, and technical support team, Kit, for their amazing job and support. My name is Eung-san Kim. Uh, I teach Asian film here at the University of Michigan. And it is uh, such a great uh, pleasure to moderate this director spotlight with Kim Bora, who directed House of Hummingbird. I can't tell how much I love this film. Um, as someone who was uh, a high school student uh, in South Korea back in 1994, and someone who was questioning uh, one's identity at the time, I felt a deep attachment to the film and um, appreciate its painfully beautiful portrayal of the story of emotion and cruelly chilling um, representation of reality. So I'm personally very happy to be able to hear more about the film from the director. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce our guest today. Bora Kim uh, holds an MFA in film directing from, um, from Columbia University. Uh, Bora's debut feature, House of Hummingbird, received production support uh, from the Korean Film Council, Seoul Film Commission, and Asian Cinema Fund of Busan International Film Festival. The film received post-production support from the, Sun, uh, um, from the Sundance Institute's feature film program and was selected as an IFP Narrative Lab Fellow. And the film premiered at the Busan International Film Festival, where it won the NetPack Award and the KNN, Award, uh, KNN Audience Award. The film went on to collect 62 awards from prestigious, um, prestigious festivals, uh, including Berlin International Film Festival, uh, Tribeca, BFI London, Istanbul, Jerusalem, a Blue Dragon Award and Peksang Award, which is uh, South Korea's equivalent of an Oscar. House of Hummingbird was selected as the best movie list of, uh, of 2020 by IndieWire and Metacritic, and was also chosen as the New York Times Critics Pick. And I'm equally thrilled to introduce our discussion leader and interlocutor, Maggie Lee. Maggie uh, is Chief Asia Film Critic for Variety and formerly Asia Chief Critic for The Hollywood Reporter. She has spent most of her working life in Japan as curator for Short Shorts Film Festival Asia uh, and Tokyo Film Festival. She also programs for Vancouver Film Festival. In, 20, uh, in 2010, uh, the Busan Film Festival awarded Maggie uh, for her contribution to Korean cinema. And she has mentored critics and directors for many film workshops and, uh, and script labs, and has been industry consultant for Japan Foundation, Netherlands Film Fund, uh, and the Hong Kong Asia Film Financing Forum. So now let's give our virtual uploads um, uh, in welcoming our guests. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Right. So uh, I'm hoping that all the people joining have already seen the House of Hummingbird. And I'm sure you all have a lot of questions as well um, for Bora, which you can do later. So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Sanjun and Unsan for inviting me to, to interview Bora in this really interesting cyber space. And I love the film very much as well. And um, so uh, to, to have a chance for Bora to talk more about her film, I'm, um, I just uh, want to, before we dive into the world of the House of Hummingbird, we'd like to maybe know more about your own filmmaking journey. So when did you realize you wanted to become a filmmaker and why? Um, first of all, I'd like to say hi to everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me to this event. Uh, so, Okay, to answer your question, um, I think I did pretty much a uh, general course as a filmmaker. I majored film in college and I majored film in graduate school. So it's actually very um, 
kind of boring process as a filmmaker. I don't really have like legendary story about how I become a filmmaker, but I think I gradually uh, have got to know what I really want in my life. Like even after I majored film in graduate school, I still wasn't sure whether I could be a filmmaker making living because, you know, like, um, in my college, there were 40 people every year, and it's been like 50 years of the history. Uh, the film program existed for a very long time, but not everyone becomes a filmmaker. And also not everyone can make second, third feature film after first feature film. So it was very hard to be a filmmaker. And also it's almost rare to be a female filmmaker feature, as a feature film director. So. I think I was questioning myself a lot, um, even after I graduated from Columbia, and then I started to teach film in universities. And I thought I would just become uh, like a professor or lecturer because I was questioning myself a lot. Um, and then later I decided to make this House of Hummingbird, but it took a long time that I really made a decision, yeah. Mm, I see. So we'd I'd love to hear more about you know, your process in making um, House of Hummingbird. But what also interested me is that you chose to study in Columbia University after you mm -hmm. spent quite a many years in Korea studying film. So what? why did you decide to go to the US to study? And what? how is the filmmaking education there different from in Korea? And how did that influence you when you were making your first feature? I think um, in terms of the curriculum that we had was similar to each other because uh, you learn about film, but I think the environment was very different in the US ah. because um, I guess it was much uh, liberal. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to generalize Asian yeah. culture, but like there is a hierarchy for sure in school. So you never get to really be close with your professor. But um, when I was in, in the US, um, mm -hmm. compared to my experience in Korea, I think I had a much closer relationship with my mm -hmm. professors and they were actually very supportive. Um, I guess because of the culture in Korea, mm -hmm. professor don't really, um, I don't know, say, like great applause to students. Mm -hmm. um, like they don't really say like good things. Uh, they, they, I think they, they hide it, um, <laughs> although they like it. Like there, there's a, some sort of culture like that. Um, so oh. I don't really remember I get like the comments, oh, your work is great. Like I don't remember whether I heard that sort of comments when I was in college, but in graduate school, I, I felt very supported and it was different culture. And also it was very LGBT friendly and feminist friendly. That oh. sort of was very great. And also New York, I, I studied in New York and yeah. it's the city that you can meet mm -hmm. so many people from different background that actually was very helpful for me to uh, like, you know, opening my eyes. But of course, I had a really great time and, uh, and met very good fellows in college. So it was very good memory. But I guess education system and the hierarchy or relationship between students and professors were quite different in the US. Mm, I see. That made me think about the father in the House of Hummingbird. I see. <laughs> he loves his children in each of them in a different way. but. He also doesn't praise them very much. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, talking about the film, I think one of the things that's most striking is that uh, for anyone who watched the film is that it's set in the 1990s. But at the same time, there's something very timeless mm -hmm. about the film. But of course, this at the same time, very specific as uh, Unsan also said that he was a student uh, in 1990s as well and made him very, very nostalgic. So, um, what were the things that fascinated you about the 90s that made you make the film in this time? And also, like, how did you reflect your special interest in the 90s in your film? Mm -hmm. I guess the reason that I set this film as 90, 
1994 mm -hmm. as the time period. It was mm -hmm. because of the uh, main reason. First reason was because of the Songsu oh, bridge okay. collapse. Yeah, and that really happened in Korea. And it was a big national tragedy. And actually, I see this film as Uni's coming of age, but at the same time, South Korea's coming of age. And I Ooh. wanted to make uh, Uni's like, like collapse among a uh, between like mm -hmm. within herself in right. his mind and also collapse of the bridge in parallel with each other mm -hmm. so i can kind of compare how this one person's coming of age is connected and linked mm -hmm. to uh, national coming of age uh, and also like I was uh, in his age when, uh, like, when it was 1994, and I wanted to bring that era um, because I was dealing with this character, uh, Uni. Uh -huh. And also, I think I wanted to look back the society back then in 90s because back then we built everything very fast. Um, mm -hmm. We, I guess we really wanted to be a developed country from underdeveloped country after Seoul Olympics. Mm -hmm. uh, so the whole country was really like trying hard to build everything fast without thinking about safety. And there was like a consumer culture, like, mm -hmm. um, like capitalism, like it was kind of bombarding uh, in that uh -huh. era. And uh, I remember like McDonald's and other like US American brand came and uh, in my neighborhood, like kids were talking about what kind of brand that you, we are wearing, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then that sort of culture and the uh, eager, uh, the longing to for my country to be like re really recognized was mm. a little, I think it was very problematic. Um, and mm. that sort of culture was kind of normalized in that era. And that mm -hmm. so Songs Bridge Collapse uh -huh. was kind of wake up for, for my country to right. be really aware of what it means to be human being and mm -hmm. where we should go and move forward. Wow, that's really interesting because um, I'm ashamed to say I actually knew nothing about the bridge incident until I've mm -hmm. seen the film. Mm -hmm. um, but when I watched that, you know the the way the um, the the bridge incident became a central part of the film. Mm -hmm. I couldn't help thinking about the Seoul ferry accident mm -hmm. and how a lot of the Korean directors are also dealing with that through the cinema, but mostly mm -hmm. documentary, except for mm -hmm. the film Birthday. And um, I just wanted you to know whether or not there's also a certain continuity or, or modern like a contemporary implication especially if in Korea if they watch the film you know when they see this incident that happened 30 years ago yeah also a lot of audiences member came to me and asked about uh, oh, yeah. Seoul ferry dis yeah. uh, uh, disaster um, and then they they said they they remind the, they remind themselves of the accident oh, while watching really? House of Hummingbird. Yeah. But I actually uh, wrote this screenplay in 2012, which was oh, before the accident. I see. Yeah, but then when I saw the ferry accident, I I just thought history is always like oh, dear. ongoing and yeah. coming back and forth. So I felt very sad, but I don't think I can, I'm ready to really talk about Soul mm -hmm. Ferry Disaster as a film, because I guess to make narrative yes. feature film, you have this healthy distance, but I think I yes. still have that trauma in my mind about, if I think about the ferry accident, but I think fortunately I was able to have healthy distance from this uh, song oh, collapse because it happened so many years ago. Uh -huh. uh, but even while I was working on this film House of Hummingbird, even just by looking at photos of bridge collapse, it made mm -hmm. me really suffer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I read that the bridge had to be completely rebuilt because it was so, mm -hmm. so damaged. Right. Yeah. 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 But I guess the um, the difference is that with Sewo, it was one ferry company's mistake. It wasn't mm -hmm. necessarily a huge national government failure until later, I guess. So I guess the context is probably a bit different as well. 
I would say it's actually very similar because oh, it is? Sorry. This, yeah, this, right. this, oh no, 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 no. Um, the disaster was very intertwined with government uh -huh. and the right. company and all that. Right. And also the, even like the norm, social norm that uh -huh. you have to really follow certain rule in, even oh, in the okay. sinking ship, like students who are taught to not move. So they kind oh, of God. listen to that. Yes. That's why there were more, many more people died. But, you know, like, uh, yeah, it's a little complicated. Issue, I so see. I, I, see. I will not talk about this now. But, yeah, but I think yeah. it's interesting that this probably gives your film a lot more layers without intending yeah. it for both international. Right. I think in a way, for international audiences because they probably didn't know anything about the bridge but mm -hmm. having that in the context is, is very mm -hmm. interesting yeah. but um for me like you know on a lighter note um talking about the 90s and also the whole general background of the film because it was set in Gangnam mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I guess Gangnam in the 90s even though it was already very luxury and high class it doesn't even compare to the Gangnam now which is like even more glamorous right, right. but um but it's interesting that the family of um Unni, they they have a business making topoki or korean rice cakes yeah and uh, i just uh, find that very interesting because in your previous short film um the the recorder exam the family is very similar to and, and the girls also called Unni and the dad i think it's a is it the same actor? Or? Yeah, right, yeah. right. But he yeah. looks younger in that film. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a few years ago. And then yeah. there was chili paste. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. I wanted to talk a bit, hear more, you explain the kind of context, the cultural context of this family that's making topoki, very traditional Korean thing in the, in the mm -hmm. kind of rising high class neighborhood and what it means, you know, like making chili or making topoki, you know, within the context, the social context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like what you said, Gangnam is very like luxurious area, mm -hmm. and even in nineties it was. And yeah. I think that there was a cultural like norm and hierarchy there. Um, yeah. I remember kids were asking to each other, "What what does your father do? What's your mm -hmm. father's car?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a silly question, but mm -hmm. there was like this sort of, um, you know, like some sort of cultural consumerism mm -hmm. was. Com Right. like like pervaded whole area and i think that sort of atmosphere made kids very suffer mm. and you know i i remember a lot of times in classroom when i was in middle school mm -hmm. uh, teacher would say you really need to go to seoul university which is like number one yeah. university like for women like if you go to seoul university you <laughs> you have like you have good husband, whatever, like this sort of thing, like, you know, okay. yeah. Um, so in that sort of atmosphere, uh, actually my parents did a rice cake house in that neighborhood. Oh, wow. Yeah, so uh -huh. um, a lot of kids made fun of my parents' oh. job and I was embarrassed back then, uh -huh. but I didn't even know that it was wrong for them to make fun of me and the job, my parents' job. Uh -huh. So I actually, it, it was actually fortunate for me to really think about like the society from very early mm -hmm. age, because even though I couldn't articulate as a as a kid, I thought this was wrong. My parents mm -hmm. are working hard yes. and they shouldn't make fun of my parents' job. So I started to really think about and like see clearly what what, what is wrong in this society. Mm -hmm. And I think I um, become very aware and interested in sociology and feminism on Arda. And so here I am <laughs> as a filmmaker. <laughs> so I guess um, the the neighborhood and the atmosphere was kind of messy but I guess uh -huh. I learned a lot from uh, uh, living in a area with where there's no love um, I guess you know you can learn anything even from uh -huh. that sort of environment I think yeah Wow, that's really great to know because I thought <laughs> there was a lot of detail in how to make topoki and the different yeah. types. Yeah. And because it's a comfort food, but also I think a very traditional Korean food, I, mm -hmm. it actually gave me a heartwarming feeling when I watched, mm -hmm. even though I knew they were struggling so much, but, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think the class, the specific, like the specific nature of that made the class comments very strong because it's clear in the house that they're not poor. You know mm -hmm. they're not like struggling that mm -hmm. much 
but mm. then at the same time like you said there's all this class snobbery and the yeah. kind of culture you were talking about in the 90s where everyone wanted to get ahead yeah and, yeah. and I think explaining this to us really help us understand mm. the film a bit more as non-Koreans mm, I see yeah actually yeah. adding adding to your comment um yes uh, Unis family is not poor but you know what like I learned what people really make suffer is not about their living condition, like definite mm -hmm. living condition, but more like more, more, more of comparison. Mm -hmm. So in, before I went to college and high school, where I can see more people from other neighborhood, mm -hmm. I thought my family was poor. But really? then I realized that in mm -hmm. other setting, my fa family was fine in terms of financial yeah. thing like you know we were not rich or anything but like it was like the, so, the sort of outcome that I was questioning was all from mm -hmm. this neighborhood and this sort of limited narrowed mentality mm -hmm. and that was actually big realization how like how we live and how this society is built like like for everyone to compare each other mm -hmm. and that comparison makes other people make makes people very suffer I think ah oh, yeah that's definitely true mm -hmm. and and also like there's a certain um sorry this wasn't in the questions I wanted to ask a little bit too is that the the kind of relationship between the brothers and sisters mm -hmm. and the fact that you know that there's also a bit of a gender imbalance mm -hmm. like kind of unfairness in that and the way the brother was beating up the the sisters I, I kind of it made me think about the film um girlhood by mm -hmm. Celine Sciamma yeah. where in the film uh -huh. the, it did that's a much more working class and rough mm -hmm. background but but the brother was also like beating up the sisters and but thinking that he's kind of like teaching them sort of thing that sort mm -hmm. of role is kind of scary but then what really what I really liked towards the end of the film is even though the father has a lot of his own flaws he was very angry when the brother beat up the girl mm -hmm, the, the mm -hmm. sister and then he said how dare you beat your sister in front of your own parents and it was quite a cathartic moment for me mm -hmm. especially coming after the girl got very upset and I just wanted to know a little bit more about how you designed these family dynamics and what you're trying to say through these different family dynamics um, I think I wanted to like depict the reality. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I guess um, you know, of course, Korea is much different uh, compared yeah. to '90s, but still, there's a like, gender imbalance, of course. Right. And uh, back then, '90s, it was much visible, much more. Mm. And that sort of uh, dynamic between sister and brother were very common and it was very normalized. Gender mm. inequality was very normalized. Mm. And I just wanted to depict the reality. Right. And that I guess that's why a lot of Korean female audiences who grew up in the 90s right. were able to really em empathize with the main character. Uh -huh. uh, but I guess I didn't want to depict the male characters as evilish characters because no, no. Uh -huh. they are the also victim of this society and this yeah. um, uh, male dominated society because I mean in in this society like when men are women are not equal uh, no oh. one is winning actually there's mm -hmm. no winner uh, mm -hmm. men are taught to be some certain way women are taught to be a certain way both are they're not winning so I just wanted to depict that uh, in this sort of circumstance everyone mm. is failing, everyone is suffering. And I just wanted to show that sort of landscape with clarity mm. and affection. Yeah, and I found those scenes when they're having sitting down for dinner, really amazing, really observant, because usually, you know, in the many, I think many Korean families are Christian, and they start dinner, maybe with a prayer to thank God, but it's almost like a prayer, mm -hmm. the way every time they start the dinner, the mm -hmm. father is putting pressure on the son and asking the sisters to pray mm -hmm. for him, to do mm -hmm. well in his exams, and that he's going to get into the great university and stuff, mm -hmm. and, then, and the way you put the focus on his expressions, mm -hmm. with, like, you know, without him saying, or he's always saying something very polite, light but you feel the pain in a right. way yeah mm -hmm. but also the pain for the sisters how 
they felt, oh, you know, it's always the father who seems to only care about his academic mm -hmm. career, that yeah. sort of thing. So that brings me back to the, the subject, uh, the title of the film, because House of Hummingbird, um, is there any special meaning? Is it the mm -hmm. same? Do you use the same title in Korean? Well, yeah. It's similar title, actually, uh, uh -huh. but in in Korean, it's it's just a hummingbird, but in oh, English, it's really? House of a Hummingbird, because uh -huh. um, if I just make title as a hummingbird in English, somehow mm. it sounded like a fancy shop name. <laughs> 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 so I just wanted yeah. to put House of yeah. so that it can sounds more poetic. Um, and the reason that I made Tighter as hummingbird, has a hummingbird is because hummingbird is the smallest bird in the world, as, as you all know. Oh. And it, it flies very long distance to oh, yeah. find the honey. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's a really little bird, but like oh. it has this, you know, stability and like the like duration to fly and it doesn't give up. So the has, hummingbird is like symbol of uh, you know endurance and uh, love and hope and searching searching for something some uh, so I wanted to make that tighter oh I see that's a beautiful title actually and the idea of the bird I think mm -hmm. it's, it's also you know that it takes flight that mm -hmm. she wants to fly out of fly towards something mm -hmm. it's really beautiful and and that makes me think about also like um, the aspirations, because obviously the family has these ambitions for all the children, not just the son, but also for the two daughters. But then Un Uni herself, she has a different set of aspirations at that age. And it's mm -hmm. sort of very much also tied up with her relationship with the teacher, Un uh, Youngji. Youngji. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to t you to tell us more about how you develop that relationship and the particular context, because uh, she goes to her for these Chinese lessons, like classical Chinese lessons. And every time she, the teacher teaches some, some words, it seems to have a special meaning for her at that particular time in her life. Mm -hmm. So, and it's very beautiful, like the way you develop that relationship. So could you tell us a bit more about the, you know, how you develop this relationship? Mm -hmm. Well, I just wanted to give Unhi uh, a good adult character yeah. where everyone around her is not like mature adult. <laughs> uh -huh. So uh, Youngji, I think I, I made that character uh, to have some, to give some breathing room for mm -hmm. Unhi, character Unhi. Uh, and I was thinking, oh, what kind of subject matter uh -huh. she should teach? But then, like, I was thinking first time, like, maybe math or English or mm -hmm. whatever major course. But then mm -hmm. I thought it would be more interesting if Youngji teaches somehow minor uh, mm -hmm. subject. Um, Chinese is uh, not the major subject mm -hmm. in school back then. Um, mm -hmm. More major school, major subject is like math or mm -hmm. like English science mm -hmm. or Korean language or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, so I purposely chose that minor subject. Uh -huh. And also, you know, like what you said, the uh, uh, Chinese maxim is, is beautiful <laughs> to uh -huh. just to learn and yeah. I, I thought it might it might sound too obvious or too like um, I don't know on the nose, but then I just decided to use that Chinese maxim because it kind of uh, yeah. brings a lot of meaning to the film. Yeah. Yeah, especially the one about how you can know many people but you have no friends, mm -hmm. or like you only have very few friends. It was really mm -hmm. beautifully chosen. So you mm -hmm. must also know a lot of these classical have a great classical education <laughs> yeah um but also about the relationship about the, the two people you know like the character mm -hmm. of young g for me she's also a bit of a character of mystery you feel mm -hmm. like she's experienced something that she's doesn't really want to talk about or she's going through something herself because she confessed to uh to me that oh there are times when i feel I don't like myself and mm -hmm. I don't even want to e exist. So how do you, I mean, could you tell us a bit more about that kind of Unji herself? 
uh, I mean, mm -hmm. Youngji herself. Young yeah, and then the way she reacted at the stair when, um, when, uh, when Uni hugged her and she hesitated, but then, and it was shot from the back and then she mm -hmm. hugged her back. It's mm -hmm. a very beautiful and, and ambivalent moment. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, so Youngji, the character, she's a student protester. Um, uh -huh. Back then, 90s and late 80s, okay. uh, right. in Korea, there was a lot of yes. students, protesters, uh -huh. um, because of the government thing. Right. Uh, and so Youngji is involved in that movement. And uh -huh. the, the song the Young, Youngji character sang in the classroom Ooh. was very famous, well known, oh, protester yes. song. Right. Uh, protest see. song, yeah. Uh -huh. So Korean audiences would easily guess uh, where she's from uh, oh, I see. just by listening to the song, uh -huh. or how she carries herself and mm. the books that she reads. Uh, mm, so there's yes. like a scene that you see her bookshelf and then uh -huh, okay. there are many books about communism, feminism, right. and all that stuff. So right. you, can, you can guess who she is. Um, uh -huh. But I didn't want to give too many details about mm -hmm. her life. Instead, mm -hmm. I wanted to make her as a little bit of mystery character. Yeah. Um, I guess when there's a, some mystery about someone, you kind of are more attracted to the person. Uh, so I just wanted to show the pure uh, connection between the two. And some people actually ask whether Uni uh, really loves Youngji as a oh. some, some sort of like romantic, you know, romantic oh. way. Um, and then I would answer like I didn't intend intend any romantic thing between mm -hmm. the two because Youngji she's a very politically like she's very very aware of political correctness and mm. to as a youngji as, mm. as a character like a youngji uh, she wouldn't even imagine a relationship with somebody who's very younger because mm. there's a power dynamic but mm. i think our deep relationship uh have some romantic elements no matter what i think mm -hmm. so if, if people see some sort of romantic vibe between the two i think that, that would be true because they are having very deep connection yeah but it doesn't have to be like mm -hmm. sort of like love relationship type of chemistry mm, yeah i see i think it's great you mentioned the uh the concept of power relationship because i guess even compared to like uh, uni's relationship with yuri and mm. her other friend this is the only relationship that doesn't involve a power relationship mm. in the whole film mm. and uh, no expectation of give and take like i feel the teacher just gives and at the same time like uni also just gives her herself in a mm. way like her, her honesty towards the teacher mm. yeah and actually that makes me think about you know, talking about this film as a coming of age, um, I just wanted to uh, to talk a little bit about your first short your short film, um, the recorder exam. And for audiences here who haven't seen it yet, you could see it on Mubi. Um, so it's a it's a film that you made in I think 1910, 1911? 2011. 2000, sorry, 2011. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, the character is also called Un Unni. Yeah. And they also he has a sister, an older sister and an older mm -hmm. brother. And the father is also having a secret affair. Yeah. Um, and uh, she's quite a bit younger, of course, in the film. And I just wanted to know, um, and some quite a lot of people have thought about this, you know, whether this is like a continuation of the same persona and whether mm -hmm. you're trying to that in your future project, you're trying to tell the story of someone a bit like the way Truffaut did with the you know with this character in the 400 blows and how he uses the same actor or at least the same character throughout many stages of life mm. well i guess um after i made the short film the recording exam which mm -hmm. you can see from movie for free <laughs> yes uh, i got i got a lot of questions like yeah. uh how do you think Uni would grow up after this yeah. film, like from the audience's member? Mm -hmm. And I like the question because I felt like audience member, they would really think Uni, character Uni as if she's alive. And, yes. and then that question actually made me 
uh, make this film House of Hummingbird because oh, I indeed I wanted to see how yes. nine-year-old girl Uni from the recorder exam short, short film how she would grow up if mm -hmm. she is in high school and middle school. So actually that was main intention how I made this film. Yeah. Ah, I see. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, but what about the future then? Um, are you working on a new film? Uh, what is it about? Yeah, actually, I'm working on quite different film, which is sci-fi film. Um, mm. But a lot of people, after they watch House of Hummingbird, they would ask the same question like you did. Um, are you going to make this as like trilogy, uni trilogy, uh, like Apu trilogy? Um, and I don't know. I really don't know because I feel like I'm done with talking about a new story, but maybe later, like 10 years later, I might have different idea and wanted to make her story again. But for now, I think I'm very satisfied with the film. And right. I think the story is over for now, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, I see. Yeah. I think I would also love to see other people in the film, like the brother and the sister, yeah. how they yeah. turn up, you know? in the end yeah. yeah so would you be able to tell us a bit more about the sci-fi film mm -hmm. and uh, what stage of development is it or you know are you planning to shoot it soon and what's it about um it's called spectrum and i'm actually working on a screenplay based on the short story by kim choya she's a very well-known sci-fi writer in korea uh so it's a screenplay stage still, uh, but it, it's gonna be a very different size genre film uh, compared to As of Hummingbird. And I wanted to actually challenge myself, mm. um, but it's not gonna be like, um, like very spectacular sci-fi film. It, it'll be more like emotional sci-fi uh -huh. journey, uh, yeah. still talking about connection among beings, yeah. Right. I think that's probably very relevant now with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. In some ways, we're kind of living in a different reality. Right. Totally. Yeah. It's like sci-fi. We are living in a sci-fi world. Yeah. yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. And uh, are you... Um, okay. So I wonder what whether you'll be able to tell us a bit more about the project in terms of like, uh, are you allowed to reveal the cast or about uh, uh, where see, you're see. shooting and... Uh, that's uh, okay. not yet <laughs> yeah, okay. right yeah because I'm still writing so mm -hmm. I don't even know <laughs> right yeah <laughs> but like Climax Studio which is one of the major mm -hmm. studio in Korea there he uh it's going to produce this film yeah that's great do you think the success of the House of Hummingbird has helped you in terms of getting your next project off the ground financially as well as the you know, the production team that you can form? Yeah, definitely. Uh -huh. um, it, it brought a lot of things to me, to my life. The, this, uh -huh. this little film brought a lot of things in my life, I would say, yeah. That's really great. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to know, um, yeah. So I think it would be nice to see if we could like have a chance to open up the, um, first of all you know I, I know that Unsan also has some questions for you and I think it'll be interesting for him to also um, bring in her, his perspective especially about being him being Korean and growing up in that period so mm -hmm. I, I would like to you know to to you know to pass this over to Unsan as well to ask some questions okay thank you <laughs> Okay, uh, so please, um, please forgive me for for having the um, having the privilege uh, of asking questions first. Okay, uh, yes, uh, I actually have two two questions. So my first question is about queer aspect of the film. Uh, I know some people, you know, think uh, the versatile relationship of uh, Unhi. Uh, as a rite of passage to, to becoming a heterosexual woman. And others uh, think that it's, it's simply a, a, um, a bisexuality, right? Uh, and others also think that it's, you know, she's, uh, she's just questioning her identity. 
But uh, in my opinion, uh, what makes the film so queer uh, is this uh, indeterminacy uh, of relationality or in the uh, indeterminacy of one's desire. So, uh, Pora, so when you when you film or, or when you write the script, so did you intend to incorporate this uh, queer girlhood uh, mm -hmm. into um, you know into the narrative, or did you intend just to show the you know her relationship as just a you know um, rite of passage? So that's my first question, and then I'm gonna ask the second question after uh, I hear your answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the question. I I shouldn't make a banner. Uni is bisexual. <laughs> <laughs> Period. <laughs> yeah, of course I intended her character to be bisexual, and it's not a passage because, like, let's say after Uni breaks up with the boyfriend. Would you guys would ask the same question to her? Like, oh, now you broke up with the boy. Are you going to be a lesbian? <laughs> like, is, is your heterosexuality a kind of passage? But people don't ask that question. So I would say Uni is a bisexual. And it was very important as a character development because I think having a like different certain kind of sexuality really, really kind of build uh, your way of seeing the life, the world, it, 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 it brings you a very different life experience and life view. And I think it was very important for Uni to have that sort of various view on her life. And that's why she was able to find this woman, Youngji, very interesting because it, there's a scene when uh, the cram school um, teacher, like uh, other teacher, mm. uh, the head teacher, she was saying about character Youngji, oh, she's a little weird, blah, blah, blah. So Youngji is not a, a interesting character to everyone. She might be seen as kind of a queer, weird person to the world. Um, but like to Uni, she finds beauty and like interesting things from the character Yongzi. That means Uni has something different uh, when it comes to her viewing, her perspective on life. And that was why I wanted to make the yeah, Uni character as bisexual. So bisexual, Uni bisexual. <laughs> Uh, the reason that I make this joke is that everyone asked that question and I was like, oh no, like that's so obvious when he is bisexual and a lot of female audiences in Korea, they find Yuri, the lesbian, little lesbian character, so, so, so cute because they are like, you know, having this affair, like a relationship and they're so little and very cute and like this little girl is very, very like assertive. <laughs> so like Korean audiences were like, oh, what a the cute beauty girl is like you for Yuri. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, your answer actually made me uh, made me love your film more. <laughs> okay, my uh, my second question is about the cinematography. Uh, mm -hmm. I find the uh, frequent use of uh, the over the shoulder shot, mm -hmm. right, uh, and the shots that showing uh, um, that are showing um, someone's or characters backs. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, very interesting. So um, actually, the film begins with. The you know the back of Uni, right? Right, <laughs> so we see right. we see her from from behind, yeah. Uh, and also when when characters are are overwhelmed emotionally mm -hmm. overwhelmed, we uh, we encounter these shots, right? Mm -hmm. So can you can you tell us a little bit more about the cinematic choice? Mm, yeah, um, I think I intently um, uh, wanted to have this sort of. Uh, back shot or long shot from behind because when there is like uh, physical distance from the character you tend to focus more like you want to see more with clarity so there's more focus sometimes um, and also the reason that I made Uni first appearance at the frame as, a, as her back is because if you see someone's back there's more suspense, there's more mystery, and you kind of tend to focus more, oh, who is she? Who is this person yelling at somebody? So there's more mystery, 
uh, in that moment. So that's why I made a purposeful choice in terms of uh, having the shot that way. And overall, I thought, uh, like, I just wanted to have this sort of healthy distance from character so that we can observe what's going on with more clarity. But in terms of choosing when to show close up, when to show face, when to show the back, it was all very, I think, uh, spontaneous, uh, coming from very much like a writer's instinct. Um, but we both knew, like me and my DP knew where to, when to show her face front her close up, when not to show. It's like, it's hard to articulate how you make that decision, but you know, from deep down, oh, this is the shot that you need to go further. Like, for example, there's a dancing scene. We need dance. She dances in the living room. It's a long take, long shot. I was thinking, I was tempted actually, I was tempted to have shoot sort of like just close up in case, but then I give, gave up because I knew I wouldn't use it. And just by looking at her from very behind, you see everything very clearly. First, first, first of all, you see her dancing, but then you kind of, feel this atmosphere around her, the living room, this empty house, and this small creature dancing like crazy. And same in the same context, I chose back shot, a long shot of back shot, um, when Uni hugs the teacher for the first time at the hallway of the Chinese cram school. And there was same intention. I just wanted to go further so that we can clearly see what's going on. And my DP actually at the moment of uh, shooting the hugging scene, he was asking, are you sure you don't want close up at this moment? And I said, yeah, I am sure. Mostly I'm very vague and like not very not, uh, I'm sometimes very indecisive, but for that scene, I was very decisive. I don't need close up for that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, I personally think that 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 makes the film uh, um, a more queer. Uh, I, I mean, see. you know, you know your uh, um, your identification, uh, your emotional identification with the characters are mm -hmm. constantly obstructed uh, uh, or constantly um, um, uh, deferred, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you know, the the omni you know, omnipotent uh, presence of death too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, let's open the question uh, and answers to the floor. Uh, we already have some questions. Okay, uh, let me let me just uh, cite. Uh, the first one, first question is not actually uh, a question, uh, but compliment. <laughs> so Louis Goldberg praised Pura as a stylistic choice uh, and compelling narrative, saying that the film was uh, depressing obviously, but also beautifully address uh, the resilience of the girl and her family, and of course, South Korea. And he also added that the direction was impeccable. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you and the second question is from Fong Yuan Chen. Uh, so the question uh, is, about, is about production. Uh, uh, I'm going to read it. So I guess there are a few reasons that might be your difficulties in producing your first feature film. Uh, I imagine the script might look a, a little bit ordinary at the first glance to some in, uh, investors because it is not a, uh, a spectacle movie. So my questions are, uh, how did you first approach film investors and how did you sell your film? Good question. I might cry <laughs> while I'm answering this question because the reason uh, for me to make this film uh, like for that long time, almost like six or seven years was because of funding process. Uh, first of all, I got all rejected by nine or eight major investors. Uh, they thought 
it's not commercial enough to have this middle school girl as a main character. So a lot of investor actually gave me advice. Uh, you should uh, make Uni as a high school girl so that you can cast a, a, a kind of well-known actress who's in 20s, early 20s. But you know, Uni has to be in middle school. That 14 year old girl, the age, specific age is very much, very in, important. So I said no, and then I got all rejected. <laughs> it was painful. But personally, I got small fundings from here and there uh, uh, throughout like three or four years, um, main, uh, mainly from Korean Film Council, Seoul Film Commission, Sundance, Busan Film Festival. So I got funding from like seven or six different sources. Uh, yeah, and then it took a while to gather all this small money from here and there, yeah. Okay, uh, so on, our next question is from Stephanie W. Um, okay, so the question is, uh, actually it's also uh, partially compliment uh, and partially question. Uh, so all actors are quite on point. So how did you find such good cast? Hmm. Um, I think I got really lucky. I really am always thankful to my cast. And when I was editing this film, uh, editing took 10 months actually. Uh, my editor <laughs> hated me. <laughs> My editor and my co-producer, she hated me because I made her edit for 10 months. Um, but we both fell in love with the cast. And after we finalized the edit and then we, I was able to meet my cast in person after, after a while, I felt really happy to see them as, as if they were like characters from my film, like living characters from my film. I guess the reason that they acted so well was because first of all, they are just really good actor and actress, but I guess main, also another reason was they really love the script. When there's a love among cast and crew, and I think it's natural. It's, I think it's, things are going very naturally. Um, and I was very thankful that they really understood the script and loved the character. And for example, mom character, she would ask a lot of questions about the character. And she would always suggest little tiny details uh, every takes, like, do you want me to do, do this? Or like, what about me doing this and that? And so, and then also main actress, Jihu, she did a great job and she calls House of Homeworld as her first love. <laughs> yeah, everyone, all the cast, they all very understood the character and loved the, loved the script well. And I think to have that chemistry between director and actor, um, I think the conversation is very important. So in, especially with the main actor, actress Jihu, I would have a very in-depth conversation with her, not about character or script, but just in, in general. Like I would ask a lot of questions about her and her life. And we built friendship for like six months, even before we shot the film. So that sort of trust and relationship I think it's very important uh, on set. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, and while we are waiting for for the questions, uh, I have uh, I have another question to you, Bahura. Uh, so speaking of the death, um, so it was uh, so time time was 1994, right? And then uh, the film, uh, as I already mentioned, you know, there's a an omnipresence of death. So we we see the you know um, the main character's uncle die, uh, and also the Songsu Bridge uh, collapsed, and uh, even uh, I remember Uni's uh, friends and when they were conversing with each other, uh, they're you know they're talking about death too, right? A suicide, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm I'm wondering. I mean, because you know, right up the uh, uh, this time period, uh, like at around 1997, uh, 
but South Korea was struck by, by Asian financial crisis. Mm. Uh, and at the time, many, many people committed suicide, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so death was everywhere in South Korea at the time. So did you like, like roughly um, intended to uh, portray that or, uh, or is it too, you know, like, like temporally far away? Well, I wasn't like, I didn't want to give like very clear idea why the uncle died. Um, it can be illness, it can be suicide. Uh, I didn't make like decision, but I was more like open to uh, whatever audience would guess. Uh, but I think death is everywhere. Like our living is everywhere. Um, and then you got to learn that um, people die. Uh, people in your life circle, they die from very your early age and you witness it. I just wanted to bring this thing. Um, so this film can talk about life and death and the circle. Um, and if I look back uh, my adolescence or like even younger, younger period, you witness quite of death. Uh, and then you think about what it means to be living and what's the meaning of the death. And, and I don't think that death always bring negative thing. You think about life more when you witness someone's death. And I think death, um, uncle's death and young G teacher's death is the actually main factor that Uni and her mom can interact with each other. They share pain through the death. So I guess that's why I uh, put this death from the beginning and then in third act in the in the in the in the end and also middle point there's like death of the uh, Kim Il Sung yeah such such beautiful answer mm -hmm. <laughs> okay uh, we have uh, we have several questions more uh, so again from Fong Yuan Chen uh, so thank you director Kim I just want to follow up a bit of my question so how did you sell your script. Uh, like, how did you convince the investors oh. uh, that this will be an amazing film? I see. Um, I, I, I couldn't sell to investor, but you know, I had to pitch to uh, organization like Korean Film Council and Seoul Film Commission. You have to apply this application. So I did a lot of things. Like, first of all, I feel like. Back then, I was a like specialist for any complication. <laughs> so you have to know about like what this organization is, what they want. So it's application for Seoul so, so Film Commission, Busan Film Festival. I just like researched their organization first and then what they need. And like, so I wrote differently about like <laughs> uh, the film description and all that. So, and also, I also had this pitching event uh, uh, to get more money, uh, like seed money. Uh, and if you ask how I sell the money, uh, how I sell the script to those, those people, um, I think you really need to be clear about what you are making and also be very vulnerable and honest about your film. And actually by the process of getting this funding, uh, I learned a lot about my film actually. Like you know about your film, but you actually know better when you try to explain what it is to others. So it was actually a good process. And uh, ha when you have interview with those sort of jury members from organization, I just wanted to be myself and like just explain why this film is important to me and why this can also matter to you and other people. That was very important. Okay. Um, so the next uh, next question is from from one of our students uh, uh, here in Michigan. So Julia Lifton, uh, she 
Oh, what's a lovely question, actually. So she loved your film so much and she even cried. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm gonna read her question. So I was curious to hear you talk more about the meaning of the tumor lump uh, mm -hmm. that Uni has removed. I personally could never imagine having to go to the doctor and have surgery by myself. I interpreted it to um, continuously highlight Uni's separation from her family and her loneliness during a deep time of need. I'd love to hear more about this. Mm. So I think um, your emotional state and your state of body can be very related to each other, uh, connected to each other. So when someone's, someone is aching inside, your body also reacts to it. I wanted to show that connection uh, between body and soul. So since Uni is aching and you know, experiencing the collapse within herself, I thought it's 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 uh, very clear to show her what's what what she's going through in terms of her body. Um, so first reason that I put her tumor was because of that to show the connection. Um, but then I put that whole hospital sequence to also have some mystery and suspense. This screenplay is um, somehow playing to readers. Uh, like after it's made into film, it's very dynamic, but like when you read it as a screenplay, it, it, it might sound very plain. It might be seen as very plain, mundane, everyday life. So I wanted to bring some sort of mystery, a suspense, suspenseful sequence. So that's why Uni goes to hospitals many times. A lot of people actually told me that, oh, you should get rid of all this hospital thing. She can just go hospital once. That's enough for her. <laughs> A lot of people actually made that comments, but I said, oh no, like to build the mystery and suspense, she needs to go to hospital a lot of times so that we can clearly see the tension throughout the film. And so through first and second act, she goes to this little hospital, small clinic, and then uh, tour. And at the end of the towards the uh, second act uh, midpoint, she goes to this big hospital. But I wanted to bring different feel, different atmosphere uh, in this small clinic and the first uh, big hospital. In the big hospital, what you feel as an audience is kind of sense of community. These people are all feeling not well. So they are very open to each other. They share food and like they just talk about little things, but they share things in common, which is pain. So Uni feels very safe in that environment. All these uh, uh, like, uh, ladies, they kind of you know, care about Uni as if Uni is just normal kid. When, normal, when Uni is actually treated like a troubled kid in school and in her family, so I wanted to show this sense of community to Uni for the first time in the film, like it's big community caring about Uni. So you see Uni feeling very satisfied when everyone cares about her in the hospital. And also in small clinic, you might say like, oh, this, this is very repetitive and redundant. But then like later in third act, you see this different character uh, development from the, the doctor. He seemed just not caring about her, but like just like regular doctor, but then he was actually indeed caring about Uni and he was, he paid uh, attention to her. And then he suggested, do you want this paper for some record? And I think that was the turn, turning point as a character. And I wanted to show this sort of community and this doctor character, uh, to Uni's life because I think life is fair. Um, it might sound weird, but like not, you cannot always have agony or pain. You have agony, pain, and then you have these friends and good things in your life. So I wanted to show good things and bad things at the same time. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the doctor's acknowledgement of the domestic mm -hmm. violence, right? Mm -hmm. That was that was very touching, <laughs> really. Okay, uh, okay. Here are um, other questions. So, Louis Goldberg. Uh, so, Louis is asking about the abrupt shift in the narrative. Uh, so, I'm gonna I'm gonna read this some part of it. In the film, relationships are cut off abruptly and the reasons for the break are often not given why does the chinese teacher quit her job without uh, telling unhi is it because she feels she's getting too close to unhi or is the reason uh, different or mysterious um she since she is involved in this protest movement uh, she does things secretly sometimes uh, away from police or like government. So she had to quit uh, her job uh, because she got busy. That was uh, my background plan, but it didn't have to be in the screen, but that was my intention, yeah, to hide her. But, you know, the reason Youngji disappeared uh, without talking to Uni was because it's hard that back then it was a little hard to communicate if you don't have phone that sort of thing and also Uni is a still a student so maybe Youngji wasn't sure whether she should have meeting with her or not yeah yeah right right that that reminds me of my my high school years <laughs> Mm. <laughs> right now now we are you know now we are accustomed to using the smartphones but yeah but, but back then we didn't have you know um like internet right uh, mm -hmm. or internet culture or internet cafe uh or or smartphones right yeah yeah okay um next question is from uh from chuhi kim uh so my question is related to the previous question in terms of death is there a specific reason why Youngji, uh, the the the, uh, the teacher, uh, died during the collapse of Songsu Bridge? Did you do do that on purpose? Mm, yeah, um, everything in the film is actually on on purpose. Like I did it on purpose, and a lot of audience kind of blamed me about killing Youngji character. <laughs> <laughs> because they so in love, they weren't so in love with Youngji character. Um, I guess I wanted to show the kind of um, abrupt reality uh, of how one person can just disappear by accident. And I think uh, on an accident like some spiritual collapse. That's what it is. That's actually what it was. Like you never know what was going to happen. And a lot of high school girls died of the accident and they wouldn't even have expected a, a bridge can collapse. So I wanted to bring that sort of reality into film uh, and showing Youngji's death. But, you know, her sister, Eunhee's sister, uh, she was able to um, move away from the death and that's actually irony and I think her sister actually in a uh, in a scene that's removed uh, there was like a long monologue of Uni's sister at the night of the song spiritual collapse she came home and after the dinner uh, her sister she would have like very long monologue saying I was survived but I am having this guilt and people die, blah, blah, blah. So even people who were able to save their lives, they had this guilt after the accident. And I guess that's very ironical. Um, so someone, one person dies, but one person was uh, alive after the, after the accident, yeah. yeah. Um, I vaguely remember that one of the one of the victims of the collapse uh, was student trainee uh, or uh, or trainee student. Um, uh, uh, anybody remember that? No. Okay. Anyway, so <laughs> yeah, so I thought of you know uh, that uh, that victim when I when I learned that Youngji uh, died 
Uh, anyway, okay, so I'm going to move to our next question from Stephanie W. Thanks, Bora. Uh, this film reminds me of my rebellious self mm. when I was in middle school, and mm. I'm interested in how Bora's rebellious self or her <laughs> experience made her so passionate and determined about telling this story. Great question. <laughs> I see, I see. Oh, so her question was how rebellious was I? Or uh, what was the question again? Um, how, your, how your rebellious self or your, uh, your personal experience made you so passionate, uh, passionate about uh, this story? This, I, I see, I see. <laughs> I think I was rebellious too when I was younger. <laughs> um, uh, I think um, a lot of others, a lot of people, they have this similar experience when they are uh, when they are teenagers. Um, we carry this unfinished business from that those days. Um, I guess we all have wounded child inside of our ourselves. And I wanted to show that. Um, and also like emotions that we go through as an adult, the emotions are not very different from the emotion that we went through when we are in middle school and high school. I guess core emotions we go through back then or now are very same, almost same. We like teenagers, they go through despair, loneliness, longing to belong to the society and the rejection and all that, uh, despair and depression and all that. Um, they go through that sort of very, very serious, inten intense emotions. But I guess as an adult, we have more skills to hide that sort of emotion inside and pretend as if nothing is happening. But we witness our wounded child coming up sometimes when we are depressed or when we feel lonely. And I wanted to dig into that sort of thing. Uh, and like, I thought it was very good to go back to middle school period because in Korea, actually, there was a kind of term, uh, which is like eighth grade syndrome. Like people use that term to make fun of uh, like kids or uh, even others who are not mature. And I thought the term itself is, was very wrong because when you are in eighth grade, when you're in that age, you really feel aching. It's serious, it's not a joke. But then like once you grow up, you tend to make fun of those years. Oh, I was younger, haha. -ha. Like I was, uh, I was like childish, haha. -ha. But were, was I, what, were we really childish back then? We were just going through a lot of emotion like other others. And I wanted to dig into that period and then also kind of make other name for those period instead of like making fun of, uh, like as like a as like eighth grade syndrome or whatever, yeah. Okay. So the next question is from Doctor Brumidis. Uh, so urban changes were touched slightly in the movie. Uh, did you include such a theme to highlight neoliberal changes? Uh, and are those changes linked to individuality as a value and subsequent? Uh, feelings of loneliness by Uni? Um, neoliberal changes. There's a late individual as value subsequently. Mm. I, yeah, definitely. Yeah, because um, if the first person, opening of the of the film is like you show this huge gigantic apartment complex which has so many doors which are very same, similar to each other and you kind of can imagine 
we see this main character Uni, but like a lot of lives from the apartment complex can be very similar, may, or maybe very different. Or like those are those lives. Uh, you see that main opening scene, um, and I wanted to show that urban landscape and also this um, consumer culture and like society changing uh, in 90s because 90 was the very pivotal point and period that um, people are changing and like in, uh, they get immersed by other culture and uh, the, the whole society. And I guess th those sort of uh, concept um, can can affect on her Uni's family members and also school and all the society mm -hmm. because even in family, Uni, um, there's like a hierarchy. Like you know, they love each other, but at the same time, you kind of know the rule. Like if someone in the family someone who goes to good, good university can be treated better. That's sort of known. It's even in the family. And then from the family to society, you kind of accept that sort of uh, norm, I think. And that actually built bit by bit to the collapse of the bridge, symbolically, I think. OK, uh, so. Um... Next question. Uh, another great question. So um, from Feng Yuan Chen, uh, I have two more questions. Uh, there, are, there are at least two medium shots in different scenes showing Unhi uh, looking to the direction of camera, close to mm -hmm. camera, but not into the lens. Um, for instance, the last shot, uh, she looks like searching for something. Uh, what is your intention in that scene? Uh, and the second question is the Chinese film title is the distance between love and us. <laughs> Interesting. How do you think about this uh, like creative title? I see. Uh, if I answer second question, uh, second question first, we didn't make the Chinese title. I think Chinese film people made that title, I think, yeah. Um, and then going back to first question, um, uh, I think it was also decision from instinct, instinct, instinct. Yeah, um, I think there there is like sort of bust shot that Uni looks almost at the camera when she comes back to her house at the night after the meaningful conversation with Youngjae teacher about the fingers and all that. Um, I thought that was the very right time for her to look at the camera so that the audience can have some different feeling. You know, when, when the character looks at the camera, that's against the rule, camera rule. So the audience has this effect, like they get they wake up suddenly. There's like some sort of weird effect when character looks at the camera. And I think I wanted to have that impact in the scene because that scene is very important that Uni kind of has this epiphany in her life. You know, when you have very, very deep meaningful connection, there's a joy, but at the same time, there's like some sort of sadness and nostalgia. She actually has grown up as a person after the conversation. To show that, I wanted to have her to look at her look at the camera uh, slightly. And then uh, the other scene was like what you what the questioner mentioned. Um, after this, after she faced the reality of broken bridge, um, there's also big uh, realization and big growth as a character, as a person. Um, because I think a person, one can grow after facing reality and painful thing. So I, a lot of people actually said, Uni is so brave to go to uh, the Songsu Bridge 
uh, to see the broken bridge. And I think that's like symbolic scene to show how Uni is going to grow up in the future after the film. She will face a lot of conflict and challenge instead of avoiding it. So I wanted to also in that scene, when she looks at the broken bridge, she could see more of the camera side. So uh, next question uh, is again from Dr. Bermudis. Uh, I loved your film, thank you. Um, thank you. How was the reception of the film uh, with respect to your hinting at domestic violence? Uh, I see. Mm, I think overall people understood. And I think the violence that's, that was depicted in the film was not just violence happening in Korea. Violence is, I think, everywhere in every different form. So even Western country or Asian country, like, Contents might be different, but violence is everywhere and killing people's mind. Um, in that sense, people understood the violence in the film and they didn't really um, objectify as if that's like only Korean situation. And I felt actually relieved because uh, some Western audiences, they always want to kind of, you know, romanticize or um, marginalize Asian films and the violence that are depicted in Asian films, they kind of see as if that, that's not theirs. But um, fortunately, I have great audiences um, that they, they can also relate the violence um, as a violence that's happening in their own country. Okay, um, so due to the lack of time, uh, I'm gonna limit our questions. We have we have three more questions. Uh, first one is from, from, from Professor Nikki Lee. Uh, this can be a personal question. <laughs> I wonder what, you, uh, what made you want to study filmmaking uh, mm -hmm. in the first place and what filmmaking uh, means to you now after making this film? Oh, that's a good question. I actually, a lot of people ask that same question, why I made a, why, why I made a film. And I wish I could have like legendary answer, but I just majored film because I didn't want to major other major subject like science <laughs> or math. Um, so I just, thought it would be interesting to do art. So in the beginning, my intention was very like casual, but then my love for film gradually began the more I make the film. And I think now filmmaking is um, something more than a job. I wouldn't call my job as a filmmaker. Like, uh, well, it's, it's a little different difficult to say that my job is making film because it almost doesn't feel like a job. It's more like, I would say vocation. Um, in, in my sound too like serious, but like, that's what I feel. I think it's a way of me seeing the life and it's more than a job. It's, it's much more than job and I'm very happy that I can make a film because I thought <laughs> I wouldn't be able to make film after House of Hummingbird. Um, yeah, it's indeed hard to make in the film. So like now I'm working on my second film and sometimes I feel like, oh, this might be, it, this is too good to be true that I can still make film. Mm. Okay. Um... The next question is also from our panelist, uh, from Dr. Lo Guangwu. Uh, in the film, Uni was a middle school student um, back in 1994. Uh, and I wonder what kind of person Un he became or, or would become uh, these days. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe she became Kim Ji Young, born in 1982. <laughs> I see. Um, actually, People ask the same question, like, would Uru Uni 
be growing like Kim Ji Young, but my answer is very no. <laughs> Because Kim Ji Young, I think she's more like a woman who can endure that sort of society pressure. Uh, but I'm just hoping Uni can grow as a person who's more liberal, um, more like Young Ji teacher. Uh, because I think you are the sum of people who you have met in your life. That's what I think. And Youngji made a big remark, made big, big footprint on Uni's life. And I think Youngji maybe would grow uh, like a person who has impacted in her life very, very strongly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, our last question is actually um, actually two questions. <laughs> so uh, it's from Hena Cho. Uh, I'm noticing more and more Korean female authors' power, both in film and literature, and it is so exciting to witness that. Uh, and do you have any recommendations? I think uh, I think she means by recommendations to uh, future female authors, I guess. Ah, I see. Uh, and uh, were there any works that influenced your work or film strongly? So actually, it's a, a, a two questions. Um, there is a novelist, female Korean novelist, uh, Oh Jung Hee. Actually, her novels are translated into English, so you can buy her book through Amazon. Uh, actually, House of Hummingbird was inspired by her one of the short novel uh, called Bird. Actually, like, uh, it wasn't short novel; it's actually a feature novel and some other her short, short novels. Uh, I like her writing a lot because it's very simple, but ha it has very deep meaning. And I think I wanted to make film like that too, very simple, but complex. And other filmmakers, um, you, I recommend Yoon ga -un and Jeon go -un and Easy One, those are, uh, uh, Female filmmakers who are in my age, they make very interesting films and their films are very popular in Korea. Uh, and uh, for one film which was made 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago actually, uh, it's called Take Care of My Cat by Jung Jae Eun. Uh, her film is amazing. Yeah, I was inspired by her film a lot. Yeah. It's on Amazon, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, so thank you all for the amazing questions. Uh, uh, um, um, and thank you, Pora uh, and, uh, and Maggie uh, for the wonderful, great conversations. Uh, so now time's up and uh, it's, it's Friday night. Uh, so we need, to, um, we need to return everyone to the family. Uh, so now uh, I invite Professor Ta Yong Jin uh, for the closing remarks. Thank you very much. Okay, thank thanks you. so much. Uh, yeah, thank thanks so much. much. Um, so, the uh, uh, all uh, participant, uh, please turn on your camera. Uh, therefore, we can see each other one more time, uh, so we can get uh, recognized by audiences as well. Uh, the, thanks for you know the the final session. You know the director Bora Kim, uh, Maggie Lee, and uh, Eun San. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful final session. Uh, we are just uh, finishing our conference, the South Korean film industry. Uh, over the past uh, five days, the longest conference ever <laughs> in my life. Uh, I think it's the longest. <laughs> uh, we have dis uh, uh, discussed many interesting, uh, important and uh, enjoyable topics. Uh, this is not the end. Uh, we, meaning the organizers, uh, Sang Jun Lee, uh, in the, uh, in the, we uh, plan to make an edited volume uh, from the end of this conference. So um, uh, many readers you know, the later uh, who did not attend this conference uh, will be also benefiting uh, from the book and uh, in the conference. Uh, since it, this is the final day, I you know, the final moment. Uh, I mean, we you know, the Sang Jun Jun uh, want to express our thanks to everyone, but in particular uh, participants, uh, presenters, uh, chairs, uh, and uh, you know, the audiences. Most of all, uh, uh, with the, my personal uh, 
you know, the hope in mind, uh, our thanks uh, go to go to the NAM Center, uh, uh, NAM Center for Korean Studies at the University of Michigan, uh, and the Professor No Jin Gwak, uh, No Jin Gwak, and the other steps, Evan, uh, Keith, uh, Kelsey, and Kate. Thanks so much. Without you, we can uh, we couldn't make this wonderful event. Uh, you know, the one more time. Thanks so much. Uh, due to uh, the pandemic, uh, we could not see each other, but uh, uh, through this you know, the conference, we, at least uh, we uh, uh, saw in the, each other's presentation and enjoyed a wonderful moment. Uh, uh, I hope that, uh, you know, that we can meet each other uh, in person anytime soon. Uh, should be, should be. Uh, having said that, uh, one more time, thanks so much, uh, everyone. Uh, we hope you uh, stay safe and healthy. Uh, uh, bye, everyone. Uh, 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 thanks so much, and see you later.